So we return to France. And we're going to look at the first of the modern movements in the early 20th century. And it's called Fauvism, capital F-A-U-V-I-S-M, Fauvism, capital F as in Frank, A-U-V-I-S-M. What you're looking at is a very grainy, very poor photograph of the interior of the Autumn Salon in 1905. By 1905, there were four separate salons in Paris where artists could exhibit their work. There were two conservative salons and two more liberal salons. The conservative salons were the Salon, need I say more, and the second was the Société Nationale des Beaux-Arts, the National Society of Fine Arts. The National Society of Fine Arts was a dissenting academic organization created as a result of a quarrel within the ranks of the academicians in the Salon in 1890. So now you had two conservative uh, salons. The two liberal salons were the Salon des Indépendants, founded, you remember we talked about Seurat and the Salon des Indépendants, founded in 1884, the Salon of the Independents, 1884, and now the Autumn Salon, Salon d'Automne, founded in 1903. Founded in 1903, the Autumn Salon. Um, that being said, we now move forward to 1905, to the Autumn Salon, Fall Salon, uh, and um, the French painter Henri Matisse, M-A-T-I-S-S-E. Matisse exhibited four works at the Salon d'Autun, the Autumn Salon, along with a number of other young painters. There was a resulting furor on the part of critics and the public that led to the works of these young painters to be described as fauve, F-A-U-V-E, fauve. Fauve in French means wild beast, so fauvism is the art of wild beasts. The Salon d'Autun had a number of purposes, um, not only to exhibit um, the most recent currents in art, but it wanted to link the most recent currents, the most advanced, the most avant-garde art with more traditional art. Um, and so um, in that particular Salon, uh, it, it's very interesting, they chose to show Edouard Manet, who had sort of become an old master by 1905, and Ingres, our old friend, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. They were to be highlighted in retrospectives at this um, exhibition, um, and so that you can see um, that um, we're looking back to the 19th century and trying to bridge, perhaps, um, into the 20th century. Um, in addition to these two retrospectives, individual rooms were set aside for other tendencies, um, other um, approaches to art. The foes, as they later came to be known, had been grouped together mostly because they used color in a similar way, and they used color in a subjective way. So although these artists might have known each other, they hadn't worked together, they hadn't you know, created a manifesto together, uh, they simply, uh, the hanging committee had decided, well, these works all look similar, let's hang them um, in this room. So their styles were similar, I suppose one could say, um, in terms of their use um, of color, uh, but um, some of them were working in a more synthetist style, some of them were even much more um, abstract. 
They never made any theoretical statements about their works um, uh, at all, uh, but they were, of course, extending a tradition of a uniqueness and independence on the part of artists that they are carrying forward from their knowledge of the post-Impressionists. Um, so as... Um, As uh, Matisse later recalled, and I quote him here, we were showing at the Salon d'Autun, Durin, Mangouin, Marquet, Puy, and some others. We were exhibiting, and they put us in one of the big galleries. The sculptor Marquet showed an Italianate bust of a child in the center of this room. Louis Vauxel, Vauxel was a famous critic, came into this room and he supposedly said, oh, Donatello au milieu des fauves. In other words, this Italian or, or Italian Renaissance looking portrait bust uh, that he thought looked like Donatello uh, was a classic work to him. And he said Donatello in the middle of wild beasts because the paintings all around, of course, were abstract and brilliant um, in color. So that's where the name Fauvism came from. What made the critics and the public respond so negatively to the new art? Well, works such as these. The Woman with the Hat by Henri Matisse. The Fishing Boats at Coloir by André de Rhin. Portrait of Matisse by Durin on the banks of the Seine River, Maurice de Vlaminck. Now you could say that stylistically they're similar because um, clearly they are applying uh, the paint in very free um, strokes um, of, of, of color from the brush. Um, in some areas of the painting have been flattened. Uh, they're using contrasting um, colors. Uh, but these certainly are not Impressionist-style um, paintings. They had been hung together, again, I remind you, because of the non-naturalistic use of color. Matisse's Woman with the Hat was the painting that most people felt was simply not a bad painting, but deliberately bad, deliberately incomprehensible, and deliberately an insult to the public who knew what good painting looked like. And Matisse was proclaimed the leader um, of the uh, Fauvist movement. So what do we have um, here? We have a painting, which is a portrait of Madame Matisse. The woman with the hat is actually Matisse's wife. And what Matisse has done is he has built up the image of his wife using the most expressive, subjective color that he could find on his palette. And uh, whereas normally you wouldn't think uh, that you would have a stripe of green horizontally across your forehead, that stripe of green, although it exists independently, is um, also the shadow from her hat. All right, so you need to be able to start to read the work in that way. So sort of the way we began, you remember, to read um, what Cezanne was doing. The bridge of the nose, that similar kind of green and a little bit of shadow uh, underneath uh, the nose. Um, so we begin to see how he is building up the painting um, in terms of color, subjective color. Um, can you tell that Madame Matisse um, is seated? and that um, she has a fan. The fan literally becomes sort of her upper body um, here. So it simultaneously reflects on her upper torso, and it's also a decorative Japanese uh, fan. She's wearing long gloves so that her hands literally become like mitts um, and uh, just simply areas of color uh, here. And you can see the way that becomes extraordinarily abstract 
on the knee as we move away from the hand toward the elbow. And then slashes of color in the background that are equally as bright as the color in the foreground, some of the same colors in the background that are used in the foreground. So that idea of compression, I'm asking you to think back to David and the Oath of the Eurasii when I started talking about delimiting space. That's nothing, of course, compared to what is happening um, here. Um, even compared to the works of Vincent van Gogh, this painting was considered messy, smeared on, and insulting. And you might wonder what's going on here. Well, Matisse has used color to suit himself, and he's arranged it to suit himself. Uh, and, you know, many who saw this work said, well, this man just doesn't know how to paint. You know, he just sort of squeezed out all of these colors, and um, it's kind of uh, hideous um, and smeared on and, and too bright. And I always feel as though I somehow have to defend him, because when you see a work like this in the context of modern art, you have to say to yourself, it is the time. It is the time for this to happen. So let's just look at Matisse and bring him forward to 1905. He was a fairly conservative painter. Um, born in 1869, he actually abandoned a career in law to become a painter. In 1892, frustrated with the rigid academic atmosphere of atelier classes of his master teacher, his academician teacher, Matisse joined another atelier of another academic master. He joined the atelier of Gustave Moreau. Do you remember Moreau? M-O-R-E-A-U? Salome dancing before Herod. Do you remember that painting that was jewel-like and colorful? That's Gustave Moreau. He taught at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and he had his own atelier. This is a Matisse um, drawing from the male model in, from 1890 um, to 1900. And what I want you to note about it is this man can draw. Yes? This man, I mean, if you define drawing as drawing naturalistically or idealizing or realistically, this man could draw. By 1896, um, he had been nominated for and received membership in the Société Nationale des Beaux-Arts. That was one of the two conservative uh, groups um, of artists that I spoke of uh, recently. He seemed to be on his way to a respectable academic career. But um, this conservative development was not to last because he joined Moreau's atelier. And he met a young number of young artists, almost all of whom would eventually be associated with the Fauves. And we can begin to understand um, how this all happened, because if they're all in Moreau's studio, Gustave Moreau was notoriously open-minded. I mean, he was crazy, and he was open-minded. And he loved color, if you remember. I want you to remember the jewel-like quality um, of his work. And so he allowed his students a great deal um, of leeway. By 1897, Matisse became more and more interested in Impressionism uh, and Post-Impressionism. He exhibited at the Société Nationale in 1897 a work which should be considered Matisse's investigation of Impressionism, La Desert, or The Dinner Table. It provoked considerable hostile reaction uh, because it, it was quite clear to his academic uh, teachers uh, and the uh, academicien that he was investigating Impressionism. After Moreau's death in 1898, Matisse clearly began to experiment with avant-garde influences. For instance, you just saw his drawing of a male model, yes, in black and white. Uh, this is his male model um, on the right-hand side. Uh, and um, who's he been looking at? Who, what's the influence here? I mean, he's changed dramatically. What, what's the influence? This is a Matisse. Who has Matisse been looking at? It's 
So you see the facets of color that have been laid down to build up the form? Who do we know painted that way? Begins with a C. Has a Z in it. Cezanne, yes. We are actually looking at the influence of Cezanne here. Between 1902 and 1905, before he became notorious, Matisse had exhibited at private galleries in Paris, including that of Ambrose Vollard, V-O-L-L-A-R-D. Ambrose Vollard, V-O-L-L-A-R-D. Vollard was promoting young artists and rapidly becoming the principal dealer for the avant-garde, for the youngest artists um, at the beginning of the 20th century. He would eventually be Picasso's dealer. Fauvism was actually conceived at Coloir in the south of France. And this is um, a um, very much enhanced and Photoshop manipulated, but I think it's very cool because this is an actual spot along the road in the south of France at Coloir. It shows you uh, this um, uh, beachside um, resort. Uh, Matisse traveled here with his family after showing at the Spring Independence Salon, and he did work with André Durin here. Um, and he started to come up with works that um, were quite extraordinary in terms of his use of color. This, for instance, is called Open Window Coloir, and like The Woman with the Hat, it dates to 1905. This work was also exhibited at the Autumn Salon, and um, it was also noted that Matisse chooses his colors almost instinctively, applying his paint in large areas, uh, some of them flat and messy, others a heavy kind of impasto. So he alternates with flat areas, and then he puts in choppy, short uh, brush strokes that are very thick um, with paint. So what are we looking at? Again, in 2012 eyes, this isn't a problem. In fact, we think this is a beautifully realistic. We're inside a room, and we have some French doors that have been opened up so that we can go out on a balcony, a balcony that has plants and containers. And then we um, see also that the balcony has vines growing around it. And then beyond all of that, we see the harbor. This is the Coloir Harbor that we just that I just showed you um, in that photograph, with a boat floating on pink water, bright green, bright red, bright orange, purple, mauve. Matisse uses all of this strong color to create the actual objects and to create the shadows, and to create the reflections um, of these objects. He, in essence, is, is thinking, perhaps, of the teachings of Gauguin, but going beyond Gauguin in terms of the freedom of color uh, application. Interestingly, while at Coloir, Matisse and Durin were taken by their neighbor to visit one of the most important collectors in France that, at that time of avant-garde art. His name was Daniel de Montfried. Daniel de Montfried. Montfried is spelled capital M as in Mary, O-N-F-R-I-E-D. Daniel de Montfried. Daniel de Montfried was a major collector of Paul Gauguin's Tahitian paintings. And Matisse saw those paintings. And I remind you that the Tahitian works from the 1890s um, used brilliant non-naturalistic color. And this was a revelation for, uh, for Matisse. Matisse said of his art, and this is, I think, a very important statement, and this is a quote. I cannot copy nature like a servant. Again, I cannot copy nature like a servant. 
I interpret nature. And nature must submit to the spirit of the picture. It's extraordinary. Again, Matisse, I cannot copy nature like a servant. I interpret nature. And nature must submit to the spirit of the picture. In essence, it's instinctive color. It's arbitrary color in the service of a kind of decorative effect, moving Matisse closer to abstraction. Um, from 1905 art, Henri Matisse's art is involved with color. He is one of the greatest colors of all time, but certainly the greatest colorist um, of the 20th century. Harmony in Red was begun in 1908 as Harmony in Blue, but it was repainted in the spring of 1909 at the request of the individual who bought it. Um, and the individual who bought it will be talking about um, uh, uh, Russia, uh, certainly by Wednesday, was the Russian collector and textile manufacturer Sergei Shukin. Shukin is spelled S-H-C-H-U-K-I-N, Sergei. S-H-C-H-U-K-I-N, Sergei Shukin. Sergei is spelled S-E-R-G-E-I. Shukin um, actually uh, uh, bought many um, works from, um, from Matisse and other avant-garde art, French artists in the early 19th century because he had made a fortune in manufacturing um, in Russia. And in this case, uh, he told Matisse that the painting wouldn't go in the salon in his big house in Moscow um, because it was uh, painted um, in blue. So Matisse painted it in red. And actually, when they take the um, frame off, you can see the edges, and you can see that originally uh, it was painted blue. Interestingly, the subject is one he's done before. If you remember, we saw that early, more conservative sort of impressionist painting called La Dessert from 1897. His progress toward abstraction now by 1908-1909 is extraordinary. Um, Harmony in Red shows a room, a dining room, with a table uh, that is set and has different objects that one would assume would be on a dining room table. There is also a woman, as we saw in La Dessert, um, and we notice that um, the, what we could call the wallpaper and the tablecloth have the same design on them, um, and that Matisse basically is causing our eyes to compress the background wallpaper right into the table. And you notice he does a very Cezanne-esque kind of thing. He sets us up with the table edge, and then we lose it. Remember with Cezanne? Sets it up, and then suddenly it becomes part of the far wall. We get to a corner, and our eye is going to have to do all the work here because he's not giving us anything to hold on to in terms of moving forward. He's flattened um, everything. He's created a decorative quality that's reinforced by the arabesques of the plant forms that make up the decoration on the wallpaper um, and the tablecloth. One of the particularly wonderful aspects of this painting um, is the fact that there is a window. Or is it a window? Is that a painting that's been framed? And again, that kind of uh, complexity of what we're looking at is something that reverts in some ways to um, Cezanne. Um, we get indoors, we get out of doors, but is that out of doors um, actually through a window? Is this the sill of the window or is this the frame um, of, a, uh, of a painting? Is he allowing us to go out to move into a kind of Renaissance background space or is he keeping us right um, within the painting. This is an exploration of pure line, color, and form. Matisse throughout his life tended to experiment with works that were extremely simple and others that were highly ornate and decorative. 
His development, however, was generally in the direction of two-dimensional pattern. And in his late years, he produced a series of brilliant works in cut and pasted uh, paper. He had cancer in his late years and became quite debilitated. But um, I might say he also had beautiful young women around him. There's his assistant on the left, and he cuts out the paper, and he tells her where to put it um, on the wall. And so he's literally building up um, an entire wall here. Many of these cut paper designs would eventually be intended uh, to be reproduced in tile or tapestry. Uh, but clearly, he has elevated color as the essential element um, of art. Okay.